For 2016, the Oxford Dictionary named their word of the year, and this is something that uh, these companies do that have dictionaries, produce dictionaries. Their word of the year for 2016 was post-truth. Here's how it's defined, and in light of the state of affairs in which we live in the world, uh, it's a great, a great word of the year. Post-truth means when objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotional, um, emotion and personal belief. Objective facts less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Don't confuse me with the facts. Have any of you heard the phrase fake news? Yeah. Yeah. Fake news is the boldest sign of a post-truth society where truth is whatever you want it to be. Truth is however you want to define it. And when we can't agree, think about it, when we can't agree on basic facts, what's right, what's wrong, what's true, what's not, it's really hard to have relationships and it's hard to function together as a society. Now, is there such a thing as truth? There's a Greek, philo- Greek scholar in the 5th century BC named Sophocles. and He said this, What people believe prevails over truth. Yeah, we have plenty of that going just now. Whatever people say, well, this is what I believe. Don't confuse me with the facts. This is what I believe. Marcus Aurelius lived in the second century, and this is what Marcus Aurelius recorded. Everything we hear is an opinion, not a fact. Everything we see is a perspective, not a truth. It hasn't really changed that much over the years. If uh, you looked at the, you get uh, the Dallas Morning News, we get the weekend edition of that. And today in the points section, which is where all the opinion pieces are for the Sunday edition of the Dallas Morning News, if you open it up, right there, the inside, there's a huge headline with a lot of editorials underneath it. And the headline is, what is the truth? People are struggling to know what is true and what's not true. Can I trust what I see on the news? Can I trust what I hear from public figures? What is true? Now, we'll shift gears. In a recent study, this is late, uh, I think October 2016, 51% of Americans said the Bible was written for each person to interpret as he or she chooses. Now, in a post-truth world, uh, that works great, but it doesn't fit in very well with what the Bible says. And here's, here's one of the things the Bible says. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. See, if the Bible was written to be interpreted as each person wants then the Bible is not helpful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, or for training in righteousness. But when the standard of God's Word is set, and it is, the Bible has great, great value. Now, here's the, here's the other side of that. This is valuable for gathering dust. This can transform your life. And it's important that you read this book Now, I recognize that, back to our video earlier, I recognize that a lot of people say the the biggest reason for not reading the Bible isn't, we say is we don't have time, but ultimately, it's we don't have an interest in the Bible getting into our business that big. And it's it's sin that keeps us from doing anything that God wants us to do. We got to start calling things what it really is. You have to open this book, and you really need to read it. When the Bible speaks, God's Word speaks. And some, if, if you don't think you have time, I can fix that quickly. Give me five minutes with your calendar from any given day of any given week, and I can find you plenty of time to read the Bible. The challenge is, do we want the Bible getting in our business? Are we afraid the Bible, God's going to ask us to do something we don't want to do? Change something we don't want to change? Uh, move in some way we don't really want to move that's usually what keeps us from God's word but listen you can trust God his word is true and he is for you and he loves you let's read the Bible now when it comes to uh, 
fake news and truth and post-truth, one of the amazing things to me is that many of the same people that I see making statements about there's no such thing as absolute truth. There's no such thing as objective moral facts are the same people who are throwing the biggest fit about fake news. You can't have that both ways. Things are either true or they're not true. Things are trustworthy or they're not trustworthy. You can't say truth is whatever you want it to be. Oh, unless, unless it comes to spiritual things. And then it's never true. It's a weird world. Welcome to the weird world in which we live. I wish I could tell you it was going to be all different tomorrow, but it's not. It's going to be a whole new adventure again tomorrow in a post-truth fake news world. I made some doctor visits last week. And uh, some of you made some doctor visits. When you go to the doctor, you go in, you have symptoms, you have measurable things going on. If, the, if you go to see the doctor, the doctor says, boy, that's a tough one. Can't figure it out. There's something going on, but I'm not sure what it is. So I'll tell you what. Let me just prescribe something. We'll just take a shot at it. Maybe it'll fix you. Maybe it'll kill you, but we can try. And so I'll prescribe this. And then you take it to your pharmacist, your friendly neighborhood pharmacist, and say, I got this from a doctor. And the doctor said, and the, and, and the pharmacist says, Well, I can't even read the handwriting. I'm not sure what that is. Could be this. We have some of that on the shelf. Why don't I just give you that? It's probably close enough. You can take that, see if it makes any difference for you. Well, you really don't want a doctor and a pharmacist who are just making it up. You want someone who's working with objective facts. You want someone who's dealing with truth. Someone who's who's basing things on something that's measurable and reliable. The problem is that a lot of people who insist on living by truth in the physical realm don't see any need to live by truth in the spiritual realm. That there are things that are true and always true, things that are measurable, things that you can rely on. Instead... God and religion get assigned to the realm of, that's just your opinion. Instead of based on a foundation of truth. And this is where it, uh, it gets a little complicated. When someone says truth is relative, just whatever works for you, what they're really focusing on, it normally means they don't believe there's absolute truth. There are things that are true everywhere everywhere. All the time, forever. There are things that are true. And you can count on those things. That's what they want to challenge. And so they say, well, some things, that appears true to you, but it doesn't seem true to me. And if you don't believe it, that's fine. Uh, if you do believe it, just don't get in my business with it. When people say things like, that's fine, that God exists for you, but he doesn't exist for me, they're expressing a popular belief. Truth is relative. Now, the whole concept of relative truth, at first glance, that sounds, oh, that's very open-minded and tolerant to say true for you, tr not true for me. But the fact is, it's really judgmental because they're saying, well, it's not true for me. And uh, if you want to live in the realm of make-believe and foolishness, then it's okay for you to believe it is true. And it's quite judgmental. No, by the way, no one really believes truth is relative. In this discussion, nobody does. No one says, hey, gravity, it's true for you, but it's not true for me. And, I, and I'm going to demonstrate that. I'm going to jump off the tallest building in town with no harm or effect on my life. Because truth is relative. People don't really believe truth is relative. They know that there are things that are true and there are things that are not true. That truth is relative statement is also a self-refuting statement. Saying truth is relative, you're stating a claim truth. And if all truth is relative, uh, that statement is also relative. So 
Uh, you can't trust it to be true all the time. That's a fun little philosophical circle we just ran. Now, there are statements that are relative. There are things that are opinions in the world. If someone says, the Ford Mustang is the coolest car ever made. Well, that's a relative statement. A car enthusiast may say, that's true. By the way, we had some serious Ford Mustang people in the first hour. They, they erupted over that particular issue. And others were horribly offended. Uh, tough crowd at 9 o'clock today. But a, a car enthusiast may think, well, yeah. But there's not, there's not an absolute standard by which to measure coolness. Uh, Except I I use our band as my measure of coolness, which explains a lot about my life. But here's here's a statement. Some things are belief and opinion, but if I say, there's a red Ford Mustang parked outside in the driveway and it belongs to me, that's not relative. It's either true or it's not. It's either false or it's fact. There's an objective reality. Now, Generally speaking, opinions are relative, and a lot of people assign any question about God or religion to the realm of opinion. You prefer Jesus. That works fine for you. Wonderful. But what Christians say, and what the Bible teaches, is that truth is not relative. Regardless of the subject matter, there is an objective spiritual reality, just as there is an objective physical reality. God is unchanging. Jesus said his teachings were like solid, immovable rock. Jesus is the only way of salvation. And that is absolutely true for all people, for all time, for all eternity. And just like people need to breathe in order to live, people need to be born again through faith in Jesus Christ to experience eternal life. True is true. All right. Now we're going to look at an example from the Bible. Of this challenge to what God says. And it's in Genesis chapter 3. My goal today as we're talking about the Bible and reading the Bible is to make it as accessible as possible for you. And it doesn't get more accessible than starting with the first book in the Bible and the third chapter. You're going to have to look a little bit, but you're only going to have to look a couple of chapters to get to the chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. This is the story of sin coming into the world. The story of the fall. And uh, I want to read... I want to read all seven verses and then I want to circle back and we're going to take them apart one at a time. Here is uh, verse 1 of Genesis chapter 3. Now, what's well, rough when a sentence starts? Now, now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You shall surely not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So... When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. A month from now, just over a month from now, we're going to pick up this story with verse 8. And we're going to run through the end of the chapter as we talk about God's making our way toward Easter. We're going to talk about what God has done to provide for the needs of sin. And it's a lot more permanent than a loincloth made out of fig leaves. Okay, verse 1. Eve got into a lot of trouble when she entered into a dangerous conversation with Satan. Satan, the Bible says, is not... a uh, a fairy tale figure, but is a real person, personality, a force in the world, and is alive and well on planet Earth. And Eve got into a lot of trouble in having a conversation with the devil, the Satan, the dragon. 
The devil is the tempter. And the very best thing you can say when you start having that, that little uh, thought conversation that you know is leading you away from God and the things of God, the best thing you can do is to do what Jesus said, where Jesus said, away from me, Satan. If you ever enter into a conversation with him, you're going to find yourself outgunned. Don't dialogue with Satan. You're going to be headed for trouble. And Satan wants you in trouble. He wants you to stop listening to God. He wants you to take focus off of the Lord. When you put your focus on Satan and what Satan's saying, you're heading down a dangerous path. And what does the devil want to do to you? He wants to turn you from God. Whatever direction you're going, he wants to turn you away from God. He wants you to miss God's best for your life. And he'll lie to you to get there. Jesus said he's a liar and the father of lies. He cannot be trusted. He cannot tell the truth. He's a murderer too, the Bible says. That Satan wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your home, your, your marriage, your kids, your life. Your integrity, he, was, he wants to destroy, kill and destroy. God, Jesus came to me and have life. He might have it more abundantly. He wants to kill your purity, kill your purpose, and he has it in for you. He hates you. We talk about how much God loves us. We say, man, God's love is so bountiful. As much as God loves you, Satan hates you at a high, high level. Don't think also that in temptation, in your, in your dealing with, with Satan, with temptation, with sin, that Satan's going to come with a big flashing warning sign. Look out, here I come, and I'm destroyer, liar, murderer. He doesn't come with all those warnings. He comes, he comes as a beautiful creature, not wearing red underwear with pointed horns and a pointed tail and a pitchfork. He doesn't come like uh, the Hollywood animated uh, demon character from uh, the movies. He He's not an ugly creature. He comes as a beautiful creature to Eve. The Bible says Satan disguises himself as as an angel of light. Now, when the devil comes, when Satan comes whispering in your ear, he also doesn't say, would you like to ruin everything? Would you like to come crashing down today? No, he comes in his appeal. He's a wonderful salesman. It sounds beautiful, and it sounds appealing, uh, attractive. The Bible describes Satan as this way. Your enemy, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, notice the tactic that Satan uses, devil uses on Eve. Because it's the same tactic he's going to use on you. It's the end of uh, verse 1. These are the first recorded words, by the way, we have of Satan in the Bible. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? You just try it. This is a key to how Satan operates. When God says something, God puts a period at the end of that sentence. Here's how Satan does it. Satan takes the same, the same thing. He puts a question mark at the end of the sentence. God says, you shall not Period. Satan comes in and says, you shall not? Are you sure? Is that really what God intended? Is that really what God means? Is that really what God wants to do? Did God really say that? Satan doesn't have to get you in some terrible environment to get you to sin. You can be in wonderful spiritual environments. And all he has to do is to get you to question the authoritative word of God. And where God has put a period at the end of a sentence... Satan just needs to come in with a question mark. He's questioning here. He, wa- he wants Eve to question the authority of God. He, he, wants, he wants her to question the accuracy of the Word of God. He wants her to question the application of what God has said. And if he can get those questions rolling, he can dismantle everything God's Word has clearly declared uh, there, there are lots of people today, and there, there are spiritual people today, spiritual environments, at some level of spiritual, where people really don't believe this book is the Word of God. They, they take it like they would take the writings of Shakespeare. It's, it's helpful. It's interesting. There are things that you can learn, but it's not authoritative. It's historically interesting, religiously interesting, but, 
but not the Word of God. When the Bible speaks, and this is how we will continue to approach it here, because this is, this is what the Bible is the Word of God. And when the Bible speaks, God speaks. When God speaks, it's the, through the Bible. When the devil comes along putting a question mark at what the Bible says, doing the same thing he did to Eve. Eve, there's a lot more to life. God's a cosmic killjoy. He really doesn't want you to experience all the fun that's out there for you. He wants to hold you back, keep you down. He's jealous of you. And those are the same things he'll tell you. Yeah, the Bible is just so constricting. It's going to keep you from a lot of fun in life, keep you from fitting in with the rest of the world. Satan didn't tell Eve. Satan did not tell Eve. She could, you, Eve, you can't have a relationship with God. What Satan said was, Eve, you can define the relationship. You make it up. You just say, well, God said this is what the relationship looks like. But really, Eve, you, you're smart. You're an intelligent girl. You ought to be able to decide. This is what it's supposed to look like. This is what God's going to like. Without consequence. Don't worry about consequences. God is going to be all good with anything. The Bible says of Satan, we're not ignorant of his schemes. And Satan does the same things today. Last, last Sunday, Jimmy Smith, in our, in our live series, talked about, about sexual ethics issues. And we say hey, God's plan for sex is it's, it's expressed within, within the circle of a man and a woman committed to one another before God for life. That's, that's where that happens. And so God's just uptight about sex. Or God's word says Jesus is the only way of salvation. One of our other lies we dealt with. And people say, no, he's not That's not true. There are lots of ways. In fact, any way or no way at all is going to get you to the same spot. It's all going to work out. You don't have to worry. And when you find yourself, because here's this this book that is truth. When you find yourself doubting God's word or editing God's word, you can just know Satan's at work around you. He's whispering in your ear and you need to flee. You need to go the other way because it will lead you down a path that is destructive. Verses 2 and 3. I want you to notice just how Eve responded. And what, what happens is God has spoken a clear word. And I don't know if God spoke it to Adam and it got scrambled in the uh, passing it on to Eve or what all has happened here. But notice how Eve responds. And it is this, the precision of God's word is compromised. Instead of being clear and sure and an accurate rendering of what God said, it's it's been twisted up just a bit. She made three key changes. The Lord said, you may freely eat. And Eve said, we may eat. And and taking out that uh, qualifier is pretty significant. She changed it up. She minimized what God said. God said something big and generous, and she made it tight and restrictive. The Lord said nothing about touching the tree, and Eve said, we can't eat, and we can't touch it. And we have a tendency to add to God's requirements, make things tougher than God even intended. We add to God's word in weird ways that repel us from the grace of God. She weakened the penalty for sin. God said, you shall surely die. You know how she said it? You don't do this lest you die. You might die. It's possible. It could be in the, in the works for you. A command of God that is questioned is no longer a command. It just becomes a suggestion. And most people, when it comes to the word of God, that's how they're receiving it. It's a suggestion box. And from time to time, you can reach into the box and pull something out. And you say, no, pass. Uh, okay, that one, that one fits in with what I already want to do anyway. So I'm on board with that part of the Bible. Verse 4. So what does Satan say? Well, he denies God's word. And the construction of the sentence there in verse 4, where it says... You will not surely die. In, in the Hebrew construction of that word, the, the not part of that comes first. 
And it's like it's being shouted. You need to think of this as uh, all caps, N-O-T, not you shall surely die is how this word is emphasized here, how, this, how the, the sentence is shared. Satan loves this approach. And the idea is, even if you disobey God, even if you do exactly what God said not to do, you're not going to have consequences. You're not going to ever answer for it. It's all going to work out for you, no matter what. Verse 5, Satan doesn't stop with denying God. He wants to raise questions about God's motives and, and, and God's integrity. Satan wants to give room for Eve to justify her disobedience. And we're experts at justifying what we do. Well, see, I didn't. But see, the reason is, oh, we've always got plenty of that. Satan will supply you with a mouthful of words to get there. Satan tells Eve, God's kind of jealous of you. You're really rocking it, Eve, and you got a lot of potential. In fact, not just that you, uh, you can be a quite the human, but you can be God. You, you have the spark of the divine in you, and, and that temptation is at the core of most temptation to sin, that not only is God not God, but I kind of think I'm God. The temptation grabs us as Satan calls us to question the goodness of God. He's holding you back. He's keeping you from something. He doesn't have your best interest in mind, and we start thinking, you know, I read this book, and the whole thing does seem kind of tight, kind of stiff. It doesn't seem like as much fun as some people are having in the world. And how to be a little more free to do what I want. I, I see other people in my world who are doing what they want. And they seem to be doing okay. And why should God be, be building these guardrails around me of what I can and what I can't do? And Here's Adam and Eve. I want you to think about all the things God has done for Adam and Eve. He's given them everything. He put them in charge of the creation. He placed them in a paradise. He comes to speak with them and visit with them. and Everything was perfect and easy. And they were willing to, they were willing, with everything God had laid on them, all the, all the generosity... They're willing to drop it like a hot rock and walk away from it in a second because Satan leads them to question God's motive, God's heart. And so do we. After all God's done, after all he has offered, we far too quickly just walk away. How do people respond today? Most people believe the lie. They look at God's word and they look at the cross of Christ and say, it's not true, not completely, and I don't believe that, and I don't need that. And even if it is true, there aren't going to be any consequences. It doesn't make any difference what you believe or if you believe. You'll surely not die. And if I do something wrong, but God's grace, God's grace will cover it. So it makes no difference if I live this life, if I follow this, this plan that God set forth, because, well, I think God, God just gives you a big get out of jail free card anyway, and it's just a game to be played. Now, verse 6, we see where the road goes. A thought becomes a temptation. Remember, temptation always starts in your mind. There's a lot in the Bible about you need to guard your mind. You need God's help in guarding your mind. But that thought becomes a temptation, then it becomes an action. And those are the steps that Eve goes through. Same thing that we all go through in giving in to sin, making a destructive choice. She saw the fruit of the tree. It was good for food, pleasing to the eye, also for gaining wisdom. And she took some. She took. And she ate. And she gave. She saw. She took. And then she shared it with Adam. And that next step's a rough one. The sinner becomes the seducer. And I've seen this plenty of times. A person in sin loves company. And they pull others down with them. I've seen people who just say, ah, I don't need this God stuff, this Jesus stuff, this church stuff, this Bible stuff. I'm going to go do whatever I want to do. Hey, you, you got to join me. you got to come with me. And this isn't just true in, uh, with junior high boys. 
It's true for all ages. We want to drag others down the, down the hole with us. And I'm, my favorite images of this, because it's so vivid, is uh, catching crabs and, down on the Gulf Coast. And you can put them in a shallow bucket. They climb out of the bucket. A big crab climb out of a shallow bucket. But the good news is, as long as you got two of them, you'll never get out. Because the other ones will always pull them back down. It's the weirdest phenomenon. And we're much the same. We're always wanting to pull people down with us into the same hole, into the same troubles, into the same sin. I think about the story of shifting gears. Now we're heading to the New Testament. Think about the story of Jesus. And Jesus is on trial before Pilate, although in all kinds of ways, Pilate's on trial before Jesus. And Pontius Pilate asked the question that earned him his place in history. When Jesus said, Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice, Pilate said to him, What is truth? Now, we have no idea for sure what he meant with the question. I mean, we just have the words, What is truth? Uh, Maybe it was just a wistful desire that I wish I knew what was true and what wasn't. Maybe it's philosophical. Maybe it was a little cynicism. A mocking joke, just ignorance. Maybe he was just aggravated, indifferent, irritated. Maybe it was something that deep within him was just a gnawing pain of emptiness in his own soul. But this much we know. The moment that Pilate said, what is truth? He had never been nor would he ever be closer to truth. Because the truth was standing right in front of him. Because Jesus is the truth. Now, people say, does the Bible really say that? Does the Bible really mean that? And can't, the lie is, doesn't the Bible mean what I want it to mean? Can I make it mean what I want it to mean? Can I make it and form it to fit me and my personal preferences and what I like anyway? Something that doesn't get into my business so much. Something that makes me more comfortable in the choices I'm already making. Something that, something that is uh, fitted for my preferences. When you take the Bible, the Bible means what the Bible means. And it is the Word of God. And it is true. But there are some principles about how you approach it. Because... There's some things you can do that will scramble God's word in all kinds of different ways. And we call, we call this hermeneutics. It's uh, principles of biblical interpretation. There's some guidelines in interpreting any kind of literature. In the Bible, it's important. And we, I'll do a course later this spring on interpreting the Bible. And I have done this multiple times, multiple years To give you some tools, because the Bible is a complicated book. It was written a long time ago. There are a lot of cultural issues to overcome and to understand. There's some challenges just in interpreting literature well. I'm going to run through this really fast to to illustrate some of that. One of the things in interpreting the Bible, we say the Bible is to be interpreted literally. I believe the literal Bible. And that's true. Unless I'm reading poetry in the Bible, in which case it's a different kind of literature. And you interpret poetry differently than you interpret a narrative, a story. Or you interpret didactic things where the Bible's just teaching a truth. And so you look at the kind of literature. That's one of the things about understanding the Bible. What kind of literature are you reading? Because that's going to make a difference in some of the things of how you interpret that literature. Consider the context of a passage for better understanding of its meaning. And this uh, this is one of those spots where... You can make the Bible say almost anything you want if you take one spot, one verse, out of context. And you can do that anywhere where, okay, let's see everything the Bible says about that topic. And you may have it land in a completely different place with what the Bible says about a particular subject. So that's why it's good to see what does the whole Bible say about the different aspects of of any. So context is very, very important. The context of the chapter that it's in, the book that it's in, uh, it, Old Testament or New Testament, all those things start factoring into how you interpret a text. Um, my favorite illustration of this is the guy, again, familiar territory for some of you, 
The guy who's, and every time I've done the interpretation class, the guy who said, I read the Bible every day. I just, I close my eyes, I open it up, and I point my finger. And wherever my finger lands, that's what I'm going to, that's my, that's God's word for me today. So he did that. The mom, oh, the mom. It says, Judas went out and hanged himself. Well, maybe that's not my verse for today. So he closed, he closed the Bible. He opened it up, drops his finger down, opens his eyes. It said, go thou and do likewise. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why you don't, you don't just take a verse out of context. You want to read the whole thing. You want to read the verses around it. You want to see what chapter it's in. Those things. So consider the context of a passage. Read the text for its plain and obvious meaning. And sometimes, and there are people who do, the, who do this to the Bible, and they do disservice. They're looking for a secret code, and you, there are books written about the secret code in the Bible. And if you look at every fourth word, fourth uh, letter in a word, and it's going to come up with something. And and you know, when the Bible says you shall not kill, it means don't kill. When it says you don't commit adultery, you just don't commit adultery. It's not a secret code. And when you read the Bible, there's a plain and obvious meaning, and you, you go with that. Go what the Bible says is what the Bible means. Try to discern the writer's intention when he wrote the text. You, you drop it into context. Uh, and there are things like know, my, my favorite book of Philippians. Where Paul, he's just, it's all joy and rejoice. And you think, boy, that, he is one Pollyanna character. Until you, you realize he's writing it from prison. That changes the perspective a little bit. A guy in prison who's not sure if he's going to get out or if he's going to die says, rejoice. And if you put it in the context of who wrote it, what were the circumstances when they wrote it, you get a better understanding of the text. Uh, look carefully at the language of the text. Uh, I gave you an illustration earlier. You don't have to be an expert in Hebrew of the Old Testament or Greek of the New Testament to do this because they're wonderful people, trustworthy sources who, have, who are Wonderfully familiar with la biblical languages who will help with this. But like the comment I made earlier, the not you shall surely die. It's really clear in a Hebrew construction. And those kind of things are helpful to understand the power of a text. Uh, notice, by the way, that whole, that whole thing, and I'll say it sometimes, and some of you have said it sometimes in your class. Well, in the, in the Greek language that means, or in the Hebrew language that means, and ultimately, you know what it means usually? Whatever the word translates as. It's not, again, it's not a secret code. and Don't make this uh, overly complicated. If it says, uh, do not commit adultery, well, that's pretty much what it means. It means do not commit adultery. Uh, if it says always, it means always. Most words that you're going to translate mean what they mean. Notice the various theological themes in a text. Sometimes you're in, a, you're in a story and it's talking about the doctrine of salvation, or the doctrine of, of forgiveness, the doctrine of... Uh, there, there are always theological themes. Look at those things. See what the flow of that is and what the rest of the Bible says about that theme. Always, and this is where we, we sometimes break down, always take a God-centered perspective to interpreting the Bible. Because a lot of times what we do is we say... Where, where am I in this? And what's my story in this? And what's this saying? And the Bible is going to speak to you. But it's going to speak to you most clearly and most powerfully when what you're seeing in here is what God, who God is and what God does and what God says. And when God is at the center of the text, you get a different, uh, a different message than if you try to put yourself at the center of the text. There's a lot we can say about these topics, but I want to... I want to land it here. The Bible has been around for a long time. And its message does not change with the times. It doesn't change with the culture. It doesn't change with the winds of popular opinion. The reason God's word does not change is because, because God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that God who never changes, this is the great news, he loves you, and He loves me, and He knows us really well, and He still loves us. And He demonstrated just how much He loves us when He sent Jesus Christ to live on this sinful world 
as a sinless Savior and die on the cross to pay for our sin so that our sin could be forgiven, so that we could walk in a daily relationship to God and so we could know that one day we'd spend eternity with Him in heaven. And that is true.